All right. So hello, everyone. My name is Kelsey Jones, and I'm a senior program manager with the National Association of State Energy Officials, or NASIO. And over the last several months, NASIO and the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissions, or NARUC, have been co-leading an advanced nuclear state collaborative. And so it's my pleasure today to um, introduce us and welcome everyone to the newest webinar in a series of educational um, webinars we've been hosting as part of this collaborative. And the topic is on facilitating equitable community engagement to support the deployment of advanced nuclear. And really one of the goals of the collaborative is to bring together state utility regulators and state energy offices for peer exchange and information sharing and community engagement and strategies for reaching out to and incorporating community input was really one of the priorities we've heard from states. So really looking forward to a great lineup of speakers today. And I also wanted to thank the US Department of Energy's Office of Nuclear Energy for their support of this event. So just a couple of housekeeping items, as I'm sure you've all noticed with some of the passcode issues getting in, our apologies. We initially had set this up as a webinar and then decided that transitioning to a meeting format would allow for more open dialogue and discussion amongst attendees. So appreciate your patience and willingness to work with us here, but just a few items because we are in a meeting, You know, please remain on mute during the entirety of this webinar. Um, we also encourage folks to change your Zoom profile name to include both your name and affiliation, just to give us a better idea of who's in the room. And you can do that by, um, there's a, a screenshot with some guidance on this slide that shows you how to do that. And then we'll have three presentations from three excellent speakers. And so we really would love to get a lot of open dialogue and discussion during the Q&A portion. So please continue to add questions to the chat and we'll be sure to get to those during the Q&A. And if there's any questions that you weren't able to get to, um, we'll be sure to connect you with the speakers afterwards. Um, and then finally, as in any webinar or open meeting of this kind, please be respectful of other attendees and the hosts can remove folks if we feel that they're being disruptive to the conversation. So with that, I'm going to introduce our moderator for today, Molly Cripps. She's the director of the Office of Energy Programs within the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation. Molly is also a member of the Advanced Nuclear State Collaborative and vice chair of the NASIO board. So Molly will be introducing our three speakers today and helping us facilitate the Q&A. So I'll turn things over to you, Molly. Thank you very much, Kelsey. And um, I think that if I were to try to get on screen, I might just disconnect myself from Zoom, um, having <laughs> numerous issues with this today. So I will just stay, um, stay on with audio and uh, take us through some introductions here. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Nazio and also uh, Nehruk and the U.S. Department of Energy's um, Office of Nuclear Energy uh, for supporting our efforts in pulling together these information uh, webinars. And so as they noted, this one is focusing on facilitating equitable community engagement to support the deployment of advanced nuclear. I think this topic certainly um, is of interest to many states, but also I think that uh, the takeaways uh, that we will learn today and the information that our various presenters will be sharing with us are certainly transferable to various other topics that the state energy offices and that utility commissioners are having to focus on um, these days. So first of all, I will cover, um, let's see, Kelsey, you covered the brief uh, logistics, and then I'm going to jump into, of course, the Tennessee context, context here, why we were so interested in this webinar, and then introduce our speakers. Um, Tennessee is one of several states that has recently either issued executive orders or done something uh, through our state legislat legislature um, to get activities in place around the nuclear conversation. So back in the spring, Governor Lee passed Executive Order 101, creating an advisory council 
for nuclear energy in Tennessee. We recently kicked off this effort and very lucky that the Department of Environment and Conservation, which is where the Tennessee State Energy Office is housed, is the council um, it's the council's home. Um, the council's administratively attached to us, so we are getting to jump in with uh, our colleagues within the department and assist with that. And with the recent kickoff, we have also looked at forming our various working groups um, such that we can move toward our first deliverable, which is due at the end of December, and then on our way to our second deliverable, which is due at the end of next October. So. Um, this information that we will hear, uh, excuse me, the information that uh, will be shared with us today certainly will be um, used by Tennessee to inform um, our efforts with what we must tackle for Governor Lee and the Nuclear Energy Advisory Council's deliverables. And so again, Kelsey, thank you for um, inviting me to uh, moderate the webinar here. I will now move to um, our first speaker. And so folks, I know we're running just a bit behind schedule here with the um, snafus as we were changing um, the different formats within Zoom. So uh, I think we're about eight minutes off. So if you'll take that into consideration as you're going through your slides and your remarks, that would be great because we certainly do want to have um, a robust uh, Q&A here. So our first speaker, we will have Christine King. She's the Director of Gateway for Acceleration of Advanced Nuclear Initiative um, with Idaho National Laboratory. Many of you will also know the Gateway as uh, by its acronym, GAIN. So Christine, thank you very much for being with us here today, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Sure, excellent. Okay, so we decided on the pregame that we're going to, instead of say next slide, we're going to say forward for nuclear. I challenge my other speakers to have fun with that. So forward for nuclear. All right, let's talk a little bit about what GAIN is doing, um, boots on the ground. Um, okay, that really was next slide. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right. Okay, so maybe my plan isn't working. Um, so in all seriousness, I'm, I'm grateful to be here and to see the broad per participation um, in the webinar today. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time being your talking head. Uh, I think you guys have um, many good questions and I'd like to get to that. Uh, to give you an idea, so GAIN is a small nimble instrument um, of the Office of Nuclear Energy and we are very service oriented in the work that we do. Um, our work is split between supporting industry and um, really kind of uh, as well as um, bridging the gap between um, federal support and state support. What we're trying to achieve on a state level is you know, helping demystify the technology, providing some technical support um, to local leaders that are uh, either initiating or considering initiating these conversations, um, customizing that support. Um, and I'll, I can talk um, a little bit of you know, some of the examples of that. But more than anything is um, not coming in to educate anyone, but informing, not advocating, not selling. What we really hope is out of successful engagement is that folks are understand how to engage. They know the value of their regional assets. And maybe this helps them to be a better customer of nuclear technology. That does not mean you're buying. That just means you're shopping. All right, next slide. I know that this group has had uh, a number of presentations about the legislation, so I'm not going to dive in. But this, you know, this is um, the snapshot that I'm working from. There's a lot going on. Momentum has uh, been building over the past two years, and this just gives you an idea of um, the past legislation that has happened. The table there shows you, though, the amount of proposed le legislation that's going on as well. So there, there are many, many different conversations. Um, 34 bills in 23 states um, over the past two years. Um, forward for nuclear. How about that? Did it work? Yay. All right. 
So what I want you to think about, there are 13 different state level studies that have been passed um, either through legislation or executive order. Um, and actually there was an announcement just this week that Texas is establishing an advisory council on advanced nuclear as well. Um, Duke posted their Carolina's resource plan this week as well. So there's, there's just a lot, a lot of information to dig into. And I would say um, friends that may be ahead of you in this space to talk to. So what I've done here is just to the best of my ability, digesting what's going on in those studies and the milestones. You can see on the right-hand side, we're expecting five of those studies to hit before the end of 2023. If we go forward for nuclear, you'll see there's a number of studies that have already been completed. Okay, so it's cute, but it's not working. Next slide, please. There we go. Um, so um, I'm working on, uh, and I'll, I'll get this information back to Nehruk and Nazio, um, the connections to these exact studies, but I did want to give you an idea that there are five state level studies that have been completed. Um, I think New Hampshire's actually just got posted, um, or at least it, it finally made its way around to me as well. Um, next slide. I'm gonna transition a little bit into a subsection of the discussion around advanced nuclear in communities that is a little bit of a different flavor um, that may be impacting um, your region or your community. Um, and this is really on you know, those, those communities that have coal stations that either have announced retirement dates or, or expecting to receive a retirement, an announcement of a retirement date. Um, most of these communities are primarily rural, under-resourced communities. So the hurdle here to continue to consider technologies or any, any type of transition is higher and harder. So being committed not only to being in community with them and listening, is you know this this also the challenge that the utilities involved here are typically small and don't necessarily have a big enough balance sheet to carry a large nuclear project. You're looking at mixed models of ownership and in some cases mixed um, mixed desires. Um, some utilities have been open that you know their intention is to retire the coal station um, and you know brownfield the site. A lot of some of the questions that we're getting around these types of transitions is who should move first? And I don't know that we have an answer to that. Um, I would say at this point, um, I think community, state, and utility should be in conversation one, with one another and comparing your objectives and thinking about how you might um, divide and conquer to evaluate this as an option for that community. Uh, next slide. What are we doing at GAIN? Um, so following the Department of Energy's uh, study last year that did some siting evaluations as a more generic study about the feasibility of these types of transitions, we've been doing two, um, two studies in um, one in Arizona at the Coronado Generating Station and, and one in Kentucky. Um, these studies are looking at um, peeling the onion a little bit more in terms of siting. So looking at the exclusionary and avoidance factors associated with siting. This is not the type of siting study that would support full licensing. So think of it more as a screening to give you a little more confidence in um, putting more resources towards evaluating nuclear for that site. Uh, the other thing that we're doing is uh, talking to these utilities about what their uh, business objectives are and uh, comparing that to the types of technologies that are available and maybe narrowing the list um, a little bit on the types of technologies to watch. What are the candidate technologies that match their business objectives for this particular station? 
Um, in particular, in Coronado, we're also doing an economic assessment. The economic assessment primarily is aimed at the leadership for the community of Apache and Navajo counties um, where the station is located. And that's to give them an idea of what not only the impact at the site um, might be expected, but what that might look like in terms of community resources or um, needs that are coming um, should the utility decide to pursue. Um, as I said, uh, both of these, we expect to have public, um, public data available by the end of the year. Next slide. We also host a coal to nuclear research group. We're mindful that this is, um, there's not a significant amount of time. There is a small window of opportunity in considering these decisions. So we gather on a monthly basis to compare notes and to coordinate our research such that it's not duplicative and that our work is supportive to the needs of decision makers for fossil stations. Um, if you're aware of someone that's doing work in this space, um, and they're not on this list and you think it would be helpful for them to join our call, um, feel free to make the connection. Um, we are expecting, I just talked about the work that's gonna come from GAIN. We are expecting a practical guide from EPRI on coal transitions to be available um, in the early October timeframe. And later this fall, we're expecting a report from Third Way um, that looks at maybe different regions and priorities that might want to consider these types of transitions. And last slide. This is an important conversation. The challenge about having a conversation about coal transitions to nuclear is you're talking about many different audiences. Um, so we felt it was important to dedicate a couple of days specifically to this topic and not just a panel on a meeting. So um, we are holding a meeting in um, Morgantown, West Virginia, November 14th and 15th. Uh, registration, pre-registration information will be coming out next week. Basics of what we're doing is day one, we're gonna be level setting on what we know um, relative to the latest research associated with these types of transitions. It will include utility perspectives and community perspectives. Um, I'm calling this an expert-filled reception. So normally you go to a reception and you kind of bounce around and you know you get what you get. Maybe you run into the person you wanted to talk to, maybe you don't. In this case, we're kind of setting it up like science fair style because we're nerds. And um, you know we're gonna pool the experts around different topics, allowing you to see, uh, um, allowing you to you know, go to the experts that you need to talk to. And then on the next day, um, we want to go more into workshop mode with the idea that having gathered the researchers together, this is an opportunity for us to listen to what you think are the, the next things that need to be done um, in this space. So we will be, and this is something that if you've been to a GAIN workshop in the past, this is you know, more typical of the types of events that we do um, where we are in discussion and trying to figure out the next priorities of work to be done. Um, I've added some additional um, resources. I'm not gonna talk through those, um, but if you're interested, um, these are some things uh, products of gain that might be useful. Thank you very much. I'll turn it back over to Molly. Awesome, thank you so much, Christine. And, and yes, we look forward to having the slides so that we can uh, disseminate those to folks. Lots of great information um, to spread across the state energy offices and, and through our um, expert, excuse me. And also, um, on our PUCs as well. Y'all next up, we have Kara Colton. Kara is the director of the uh, Nuclear Energy for the Energy Communities Alliance. Kara, I'll go ahead and turn it right over to you. I'll note that we're at uh, 1226 with our time. So I think we're, we're doing well here. Thank you, Molly. Hi, I'm Kara Colton with the Energy Communities Alliance. I wanna start out first by saying thank you to NASIO and to NARUC 
And also thank you to Christine and to Jackie, who I have the pleasure of working with quite often. I love to be on a panel with them. So thank you very much for that opportunity. Next slide, please. So first and foremost, in case you aren't familiar with ECA, I will just give a little bit of background. ECA was formed about 30 years ago by local governments that are across the Department of Energy's federal nuclear complex. So we host DOE, national labs, the R&D efforts, uh, nuclear weapons facilities, nuclear component manufacturing. Our sites are uh, de facto interim storage sites of defense nuclear waste, but our sites are also the potential hosts uh, for new nuclear energy. Um, the ECA membership, we as local elected officials share the same responsibility that the federal government has. We are responsible for protecting the human health and environment in our communities in a way that responds to the community and provides economic opportunity into the future. Many of our communities have been engaged specifically in siting for over 40 years. That's mostly on the waste side, um, since we haven't been doing as much new nuclear siting. Next slide, please. So just to give you a sense of who our members are, there are a lot of leaders in the community, some elected, some not elected, but you can see they include chambers of commerce, port authorities, the economic development entities, as well as some school districts. So everybody who's impacted by different nuclear legislation, be it state or federal, uh, our communities are the communities that are directly impacted by those kinds of legislation. Next slide, please. So our mission simply is to basically be a voice of these communities and ensure that our environmental safety, health, and economic priorities are considered in decision-making by the Department of Energy because those decisions impact our communities directly. Now, originally, next slide, we were focused on the cleanup mission at the Department of Energy with the Office of Environmental Management, but as support for new nuclear has developed, we are also very interested in being part of that new phase of nuclear. So we created about two years ago, the new nuclear initiative. And we hoped that it would have a more fun, scientific, nerdy sounding name. But we found that when we're talking to people, new nuclear is new to them. Uh, so they think of the old kind of nuclear and new nuclear actually fits despite uh, its seemingly boring name. Uh, the new nuclear initiative is chaired by Rebecca Casper. She's the mayor of the city of Idaho Falls, which houses the Department of Energy's Idaho National Laboratory. And the entire initiative is focused around the three core questions you see here. And I won't read them, but I will say that it is in response to things like Christine just said, which is, when it comes to who moves first, I'm not sure there's a definitive answer. So instead, we are trying to break down the silos that often exist when it comes to discussions of new nuclear development and make sure that the developers right now can hear what the communities are interested in or not interested in, or the Department of Energy can find out which communities are already interested and have resources available or what kind of resources they know that they need. So we have brought together um, all of the different entities that are working on advanced nuclear development. Uh, we've had two what we call ECA forums. The first one was in Salt Lake City. Uh, that was two years ago. The last one was this spring in Paducah, Kentucky. And we were fortunate enough to have support from both Christine King at GAIN and also Jackie at the Good Energy Collective. So we certainly thank them for that. We've already planned our next meeting. It's going to be in May 2024 around the Tri-Cities in Washington State. Um, and just to give you an idea of, of what we think we bring to the table in this, um, it's that we can speak to communities who maybe don't have a nuclear history and don't know what it is to have a nuclear mission in your backyard. And as local government, we can say, you know, here are things that you should be thinking about based on our previous experience with DOE's nuclear missions. So next slide. 
And to do that, we want to bring in some of the communities that are considering commercial nuclear facilities. Um, they don't necessarily need to be energy production, but as you can see, we're trying to amplify the voice of the local communities that are directly impacted and are hosting or will host these kinds of facilities. We wanna help them get engaged. So no longer does ECA membership only apply to communities across the DOE nuclear complex, but across the country as well. Next slide, please. So in all of our work, um, we are very engaged, obviously, as a key stakeholder. And I know the word stakeholder is not a perfect word, but I think um, it encapsulates what we're trying to talk about today. And stakeholder engagement and how it is done will absolutely impact trust, whether people trust the project, the capacity of the community. Are they making decisions that are informed decisions? What have they learned about nuclear? What do they know? What do they need to know? It impacts partnership and support for a project, whether that's local, state, uh, local, and the region, or just two neighboring communities. To build support for a project, there needs to be communication from everyone who is impacted, whether they think they are directly impacted or whether they think that they are somehow impacted down the road for these projects. Um, how decisions are perceived. Risk is one of the big issues that we deal with. And Often I've heard people say, risk is the way that people feel about the facts. So we can present facts, but we need to have conversations that look at how people perceive those facts. And then finally, how to address environmental justice and equity. Uh, a lot of terms we hear a lot about now, um, there isn't one set definition, there is no one size fits all approach. And one of the things we've learned is that communities need to be able to have flexibility and how those issues are addressed and mitigated. Next slide, please. So this is just a chart. What do you need to uh, have in place when it comes to communication and engagement? Um, some of the things I would highlight on this slide, uh, announcements are not engagement. Uh, saying that you're coming to look at the possibility of citing something in a community, that's an announcement. Until you're sitting down and, and building relationships, you are not meaningfully engaged. Um, some other things I think definitions matter. As I said before, uh, we don't know exactly how each community defines mitigation of EJ issues. We also don't know exactly how consent is going to be defined. And we definitely recommend that there is some flexibility to reflect the community's uh, perspective and priorities. Um, know and understand all goals. I would just once again raise the uh, forums that ECA is hosting that tries to bring together all of these different groups and have them talk together and hear each other's priorities, hear each other's challenges and work together, again, building those relationships and that trust around a, a project. Um, one other thing I'd like to hit is communities need resources and experts to engage. One of the things we say a lot um, at ECA is that resources will need to be provided to communities to allow them to pick their own independent assessors that they feel have that community's best interests in mind. And then finally, one other thing I'd like to highlight here is defining opportunities, risks, timelines, be truthful and realistic. Um, that is a huge one for us because that is talking about waste. Oftentimes we talk about new nuclear and it's incredibly exciting, all of the different technological advancements, uh, but there's still a waste stream. And so we want to make sure truthfully that communities understand the whole life cycle of a nuclear project. Next slide, please. Um, I know that I was asked to speak a little bit about consent-based siting. So as I already said, we don't believe that there is one size fits all agreement. Um, one of the things we have suggested is that there start to be parameters set out as to what does consent mean. And that probably has to be a conversation with the federal government, as well as state government, as well as local government. Um, informed consent yields enduring consent. That goes back to capacity building in a community that's making a decision. If they're not informed, we can't really rely on that consent to endure the political change that we've seen that impacts nuclear development. 
Um, stakeholder versus interested party. This is another challenge. I think I would point to Yucca Mountain to best uh, to best uh, demonstrate this. You had the communities that were around Yucca Mountain who were very positive and very supportive of Yucca Mountain. And then you had Clark County, which had a very different position on Yucca Mountain. And we are now in that stalemate. So stakeholder versus interested party, again, something that needs to be discussed. And then finally, stakeholder engagement and consent-based citing. There are so many opportunities right now for win-wins, federal, state, local, regional wins, whether it's coal to nuclear and ensuring an economic opportunity outlook for those communities that are having their coal facilities decommissioned. Uh, DOE recently announced a clean up to clean energy initiative, which is looking at developing clean energy projects on federal land that they would lease out. Um, there are obviously carbon reduction goals at the federal level. Also, states have carbon reduction goals. So there is a win-win there with new nuclear development and clean energy jobs. Again, communities want to provide opportunity for people in their community to have good, high-paying jobs. Next slide. And I know that this is mostly on the wayside, but some of the lessons that we have learned from any siting uh, that can be applied, I think, across the board. Uh, from WIP, we knew that there needed to be an extended timeline for engagement. Hopefully it won't take as long for advanced nuclear because I think uh, we'd like to see it move more quickly, but engagement is an iterative process and there needs to be an expectation that if you're gonna get a regulation passed, and that's going to take time, so will building support around a project by having engagement. Um, an existence of a clear benefit for citizens of the state and local jurisdiction where that, that, where that facility will be. Uh, there was competent technical oversight by the state of New Mexico, and that meant a lot to the locals in New Mexico. As I said, the iterative outreach, quality assurance, so third-party experts coming in, and they had local champions doing a lot of the education, which really helped with the credibility of the information that was being shared to the community. Next slide. And as I already mentioned, Yucca Mountain or PFS, uh, the private fuel storage uh, example, those are failed siting. And that was where the state was not aligned with the tribe. The tribe was not uh, necessarily aligned uh, with the federal government and the federal government agencies themselves were not aligned. So it is important local support is needed for a project to be successful, but so is state government support. Next slide. And then one of the other areas we are working in right now that I thought might be interesting for you all to hear is our international partnerships. So we've been working in Canada and in Europe with municipalities that are similar to ours on issues regarding not only waste management, but also new nuclear development. And that's been a really exciting partnership for us because we found that there are a lot of common concerns and issues within the international community. So I will start. Sorry. And so just so you know, in our discussions with them right now, here are those joint recommendations that we've all internationally been able to land on, engaging early and often, providing resources, everything I've said. It applies whether we're in the United States or abroad. And we know that new nuclear developers they want to see new nuclear developed in the United States, but also for real success, we need to deploy internationally. And that's kind of a national security issue um, as well. And so we are excited to have these partnerships and continue working um, internationally. Next slide. I will stop for now. Thank you very much. And I look forward to the discussion. All right, thank you very much, Kara. And I think I have finally figured out that, um, yay, get on camera. Hello, everyone. Um, all right, so that we continue moving on through our program today. I will note that our uh, next presenter is Jackie Toth. She is the Deputy Director for Good Energy Collective. Um, Jackie, I will turn it over to you to run through your uh, slides. We are now sitting at uh, 1241, still doing great on time. Thanks.
Great, thanks so much, Molly. And, and hello to everybody here. Uh, really glad to contribute toward this discussion on, I think probably one of the most important but consistently undercounted components of the advanced nuclear conversation, uh, which is community engagement. And you really did just hear from, I think, two of the foremost practitioners of the day on this topic. So big appreciation to Nehruk and NASIO staff for convening us today. Uh, forward for nuclear, AKA next slide. All right, first, just a quick word on good energy. Uh, we're a policy research organization that advances the kinds of policies that you know look at nuclear's past and start to address some of the historically informed barriers to broadened social acceptability that nuclear still faces, and then also look to nuclear's future and see how we can kind of enable the adoption of advanced nuclear while we're ensuring that local communities are supported as the key players that they are in the energy conversation. Next slide, please. You can see here some of our uh, main organizational goals and really like Kara at um, ECA, you know, we're, we're centering community needs and interests in the nuclear conversation so that there are ultimately places interested in hosting advanced reactors uh, once they're ready for prime time in the near term. Next slide, please. So we've looked at opportunities in nuclear for communities facing coal plant closures. Um, our 2021 report on the topic was one of the first to identify some of the geographies that based on a set of technical coal plant criteria uh, and sociopolitical considerations could be among some of the most suited to repowering with nuclear. Um, and that report's been cited in the 2022 report from the Idaho National Lab that really has quantified the scale of opportunity we're talking about um, as Christine spent some time on in the coal to nuclear conversation that really does suggest 80% uh, of retired and operating coal plant sites could theoretically be suited to hosting advanced nuclear. Uh, and like the Energy Communities Alliance, um, you know, our organization is one of 13 consortia that the Energy Department has selected to build capacity in a few localities uh, and inform the department's approach toward the consent-based siting of one or more federal interim waste storage facilities. Next slide, please. So we just celebrated our three year anniversary uh, this past Friday. And speaking of anniversaries, the president signed the Inflation Reduction Act into law a year ago yesterday. Uh, happy birthday to Uncle Ira, as a lot of us uh, are, are, have been calling him over the last couple of years. In past conversations that NARUC's hosted, I've, I've spoken about how the IRA really changed the ball game in terms of starting to address uh, the historical cost challenge that nuclear has faced. And just yesterday, Axios Pro had run an article about how the investment tax credit that advanced nuclear qualifies under, under IRA um, is helping developers justify the costs of their first of a kind reactors accessing private equity. Um, you know, the law is really making nuclear projects a lot more economically attainable, not just for large utilities, but also for some of the smaller uh, power providers uh, for whom you know, large nuclear was historically unattainable and for whom mixed models of ownership, as Christine mentioned, um, are worth exploring. And that recording's available on NARUP's YouTube channel, uh, might be of interest to folks, along with our uh, December panel on public opinion on nuclear energy. So kind of taking those in summary, with the IRA, we're in a good place from an innovation and investment standpoint for advanced nuclear, but nuclear also comes with unique project risk issues related to public perception. Um, these are concerns about legacy pollution tied to weapons testing, uranium mining contamination, the three big accidents we all know about, the sense of dread some folks have about nuclear writ large, the cost of reactors, an evolving but I think still kind of unwritten story about what we're going to do with the waste. Um, the fact that as opposed to renewables, people haven't really seen advanced reactors function yet. Uh, we have to build one first. And it's hard to picture what you can't see and feel. Having a tactile and visual sense of these projects starts to help make some of them feel less uh, theoretical. So these issues will come up with utilities um, and communities in engagements around siting advanced nuclear. Next slide, please. Uh, so kind of with that in mind, this is why community engagement matters for nuclear. Um, because of our growing recognition that the siting processes of the past won't work for the siting practices of today. Um, the National Academies of Science convened a workshop last year to discuss this social dimension of nuclear. And there, Todd Allen of the University of Michigan, who I think I saw is on the call today, hi Todd, a <laughs> room of nuclear experts, 
Um, you know, if they knew of a time a community was empowered to decide what kind of energy technology it wanted or not, no one could. <laughs> As we know here, developers usually are the ones to pick the energy project site in advance of the community having an opportunity to weigh in. And with citing advanced nuclear, for these projects to be successful, this historic paradigm needs to shift. I think increasingly you all, local elected officials and communities, you know, have strong opinions about what kinds of energy you do or do not want in your neighborhoods. And that has implications for states to meet their decarbonization and energy reliability goals. Um, by our understanding, the projects most likely to succeed are ones in which all key stakeholders like Christine and Kara have enumerated um, are at the table early and kind of thinking about these projects together um, to increase the likelihood of project success and happy, empowered communities. <laughs> and also to reduce the likelihood of lawsuits and bad press. So there are a lot of reasons to take this really seriously. Um, I want us to recognize that with community engagement for nuclear, in one sense, it's important to recognize that none of this really requires recreating the wheel on tenets of good local outreach and participation. Uh, consensus building, consent-based siting, there are established methods for how to do this well. A lot of it also isn't rocket science at the end and can kind of be distilled into just following the golden rule. Um, but at the same time, you know, community engagement for nuclear does pose some of these unique challenges that we've talked about. Next slide, please. So, you know, at risk of a little bit of redundancy, and I want to make sure we leave time for questions, you know, you'll be noticing some common themes, I think, among the speakers today about, you know, what constitutes effective community engagement. Um, and then I'll just leave you with a couple thoughts um, on what you as energy officials and commissioners maybe should be looking for in demanding <laughs> what to demand of the reactor developer community, too, as some of these conversations progress. Um, so certainly prioritizing relationship and trust building from the outset, even before site selection, having preliminary conversations with community members should be taking place. Um, the people that are having these conversations should be doing research on local histories that are informing local sentiment about environmental issues. Um, and Kara mentioned environmental justice, and I think this is important to, to underline here. I mean, by the federal definition, Environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of communities in decisions that affect their health and environment. And this is how we do this. We just, you know, bring all stakeholders, I know Christine doesn't like that word, all people with something to, to contribute to gain out of these conversations, um, gain pun not intended, um, to be at the table. So developers should really be internally emphasizing and able to convey to you all um, that they're committed to getting engagement right the first time, because sometimes the community will not give them a second chance and it makes future conversations about nuclear and other energy projects more difficult in that state and nationally. It's important to incorporate local feedback and really show by action that you're actively listening and taking community input um, back with you and having that shape the project. If folks feel like they're um, thoughts are falling on deaf ears, it's not effective engagement and it won't build trust. Likewise, engage on locals terms, um, you know, are there certain times of day that work best for certain groups? How do local tribal groups prefer to engage? What is their preferred process? Um, how can you foster just local agency in some of these conversations when the balance of power um, is perceived as usually tilting toward the developer? And relatedly, the term educate can come off as top down and condescending. We hear this a lot in the nuclear community that all it takes is some broader education on the merits of nuclear and public favorability will increase. Um, approaching it as engagement, I think centers the exchange and the willingness of all parties to listen and solve problems together. Um, I think Christine mentioned this as you know an information exchange an informing process. Um, yeah, so certainly too, assuming good faith, I think it's important to leave um, leave priors at the doorstep, you know, I or a utility might have certain expectations about how environmental groups or labor unions or utility representatives might act, but I think it's important to leave some of those assumptions about end goals behind and establish common ground, focusing on the shared end goals. Uh, understanding, you know, who community members look to for news, inspiration, validation, these are some of the key individuals to engage with early in the process of community engagement. Um, 
It's also important to think about compensating local stakeholders who participate in formal conversations with you or with developers about nuclear, um, being prepared to give them something for taking the time to engage with you. Um, as Kara mentioned, to support communities also in identifying uh, and paying for their own environmental analyses from folks that they would trust um, that still results in good science. Um, so thinking too about ways to encourage or require stakeholder engagement plans. A lot of you will be familiar with how at the energy department, they're now requiring federal grant applicants to identify outright uh, who and when and how they'll be conducting community engagement. I think this is good practice even for projects without federal awards. Um, and it helps you see, you know, how they're, whether and how they're thinking about genuinely engaging with folks on the ground. Likewise, as these projects move a little bit further toward, you know, getting on the ground, looking at community benefit agreements as a, as a means of, of moving these projects forward, um, simply an agreement between a developer and a community coalition of various groups where the developer will be providing certain benefits to the community in return for local support, which by then hopefully would be earned. All right, next slide. I know we're we're close to time. I'm just, uh, I'll wrap up by saying, you know, just I think in identifying who in the developer community too is, is doing these things right, you can look for a few signs to really evaluate um, whether they're taking community engagement seriously. Is public engagement baked into their execution plan? Do senior officials within the company support carrying out of this work? Do they dedicate resources um, financially and otherwise um, to set aside specifically for community outreach? And are there clear milestones as the project advances agreed upon with the community for opting out of a project? Also important. Um, I'll close, I think, by saying, you know, it's really worthwhile to ask developers how they're choosing project sites. Um, finding the right community is important. Um, one that will validate the project can become kind of an ambassador to other states or areas that are considering nuclear as an asset. And final slide, please. Um, I think it's worth having further conversations about what state and federal nuclear policies that address some of the difficulties of engagements around nuclear, whether it's providing state or federal funding for feasibility studies that involve local communities, continuing to fund federal nuclear waste storage efforts, um, pushing Congress and the administration to keep the local support dimension in mind. Um, we're glad to be a resource and thought partner in that conversation with you. The QR code lets you sign up for our newsletter and you're welcome to reach out anytime over email. Thanks. All right, thank you very much, Jackie. I um, appreciate all of those insights. And I've seen in the uh, chat that uh, folks had asked about the slides. Again, yes, we will make sure that the slides are pushed out. And I believe the, of course, recording um, for the webinar will be available as well. Um, so I'll get us jump started with our Q&A here. Um, so first I will tackle, um, how we can best identify communities that are interested in advanced nuclear. So of course, any of our uh, speakers today, if you have information to share um, how states can best identify communities that are interested in advanced nuclear, please uh, share that with the participants today. All right, Kara, it looks like you are wanting to go first. Well, I'll just say there are communities that have already raised their hands. Um, and I, one of the things I love about Christine's slides is they go where they're asked to go. And having the uh, fortunate experience of working with Christine, I don't know when she's ever home. So there are plenty of, of people that have raised their hands with interest in new nuclear development. Um, our communities with ECA, uh, the, the ones who are dealing with legacy defense waste, they're already engaged in projects around Oak Ridge. You have, Her you have the Hermes by Cairo project around Idaho National Laboratory. You have New Scale. You have the Marvel project out in the Tri-Cities. You have X Energy um, in Texas, where the Pantex uh, facility is located. X Energy is working with Dow, which is um, very interesting co-location and industrial applications for nuclear is a real uh, hook for communities that are looking at 
bringing in new economic opportunities and at the same time supporting an all of the above energy strategy. Uh, nuclear is an additive energy resource and it can help facilitate renewables on the grid as well. Um, so I would say that there are more communities out there probably than we already know about um, and finding the avenues for them to demonstrate their interest is, is one of those challenges that we need to meet right now. So I think there's a, so one, the way we surface an invitation just is reaching out to local leadership that, you know, depending upon the state, um, you know, we have a significant number of states that are, their economy is tied to fossil fuel use. You know, so having a conversation that's specific around um, that economic transformation Right. So, you know, what are you thinking about relative to how you might be handling that transition from an economic perspective? I have been surprised at the amount of engagement we've had actually with economic development teams and less on the energy side of the equation. So don't don't get stuck in um, where the conversation might lead from. You might be surprised. And Jackie, did you have anything to add? No, they, they said it perfect. All right. All of us. Okay, great. Um, I love that we do have a question in the chat that I will go ahead and cover. Um, it's from Matt. And the question is, has there been any interaction between ECA and members of the medical physics portion of the nuclear industry? An example was Shine, SHINE, Medical in Janesville. Um, no, not specifically around um, isotope creation and all of that good stuff, although some of our communities I know are interested in that. I know around Carlsbad, there's there's been discussions of, of getting engaged on that kind of project. It's a bit more uh, broad right now in terms of discussion of specific projects um, and wants within the communities that we represent. But if you know of a community who is interested, we want to know them too. I think on that front also um, what we're seeing is discussions that emerge from, so I'm going to do nuclear for electricity production. Now that I have that technology in my state, what else can I do with it, right? And I think that's where you start to look at um, opportunities within the supply chain Right. So do you have to host a reactor to be a member, you know, to be part of the success, uh, the potential success around new nuclear reactors? No, there's a lot. Um, the nuclear ecosystem is rather large. Um, and then there's um, I tend to think of nuclear as an enabling technology to other things. All right, thanks, Karen. Thanks, Christine. Um, any other follow up? Uh, Jackie, anything to add there? All right. Um, I am checking the chat again. I don't, let's see. I don't see any additional questions in the chat. So I will ask one um, that is going to sound like one of the most uh, <laughs> softball questions ever. Um, but for those of us in particular who are newer to these conversations, um, or that it's been a while since we have been engaged, if you all could speak to, and again, you've already touched on this, but if you could speak to or advance the conversation on around um, the concerns from communities that states should be prepared to address. Um, so Jackie, I'm gonna start with you on that one. Yeah, sure, happy to. I think um, in addition to some of the ones that, that I and others mentioned today, um, states probably good to keep aware of the state of play, you know, of advanced nuclear developments um, going on all the time, I think. Um, it's important to be able to provide answers to connect community members with the developers, with NGOs, federal officials who can also answer some of their questions directly at this stage. Christine had a great slide um, that I'm glad will be sent around, um, flagging Gaines' fantastic repository of 
uh, different developments in the nuclear space. It's targeted to some of the, the most key uh, breaking through the, the noise kinds of things going on. Um, certainly to follow what's going on at the um, energy department right now regarding um, nuclear waste and uh, efforts to, to site a federal interim waste storage facility. Um, I think what, what, what's, what about the waste will always be one of the primary questions that, that communities have understandably. And it's important for us to be able to point to any kinds of progress in that space. And we're finally able to do that, thankfully, um, but there's still a lot, a lot to go. Yeah, leave others. All right. Thank you, Jackie. Do Christine or Kara have any other comments to add to that particular question? Yeah, so I think in terms of um, some of the things we've heard in community, um, certainly, certainly leading with the facts. Um, and Kara brought up, you know, the waste can be um, waste can be a challenging conversation. Um, I think, you know, acknowledging that there's a lot of things that are going in parallel right now. It can be difficult to keep track of everything. Um, I think one of the more important conversations you can have in a state though, I think um, Alaska is a good place. Uh, I think the, their rulemaking was just put out in July. So as a state, you need to consider what is going to be the engagement around permitting this large project, right? Understand what your federal review gives you and what you need or want to have happen at a state level relative to permitting these projects. Both Wyoming and Alaska have been looking at ways to simplify their permitting and also clearly articulate, um, and that's where Alaska, I think in their recent rulemaking did a good job. And Kelsey, I'll get the, the link to the rulemaking. Um, you know, I, I thought they did a good job to say, look, there's engagement, about public health and safety because you're next to an industrial facility. And then there's also engagement with the federal government around the safety associated with operating um, a nuclear power plant with radioactive materials, right? So I think that's one way at a state level we can help our citizens understand help and you know understand where to engage and what that conversation is gonna look like. And I would just add right. that something that's maybe a smaller, um, but just as important, things like workforce development goals, um, what kind of jobs are a community looking for, what is the state looking for, what kind of training programs or relationships with universities um, already exist, uh, so we can, again, move things along a bit more quickly. Uh, as as everybody said, waste is a big issue, and I think we've got some lessons learned from that. I know out in Ashford, New York, there were differences in the, de the definition, for example, of high-level waste. And because there is a difference between the state's definition and the federal government's definition, that waste is stranded right now. And if you talk to the Matt mayor of that community, he'll tell you, I really wish we thought about this ages ago. And so, you know, ECA members in that sense can be a good resource for other communities who are starting but want to learn the lessons that, that these other communities have already engaged in nuclear projects have learned. Um, transportation is something that I think that the states should be thinking about that tends to be the long pole in the tent for a lot of uh, communities or nuclear skeptics, if you will. Um, and also, how can the state make their state more attractive to nuclear developers. Um, I think that you know tax tax situations, abatements, all of those good things, those are conversations that should be had um, as early as possible to make sure that, you know, I know that originally in the aughts that TVA was planning to build, I think 16 small modular reactors. They did not build 16 and you had a community holding the bag, having offered a tax situation to make it more attractive there. So I think those are the kinds of conversations that communities should be having with the state, but that the state itself should also be having internally to respond uh, to communities or developers that are looking there. All right, great. Thank you, ladies. I appreciate the feedback. Um, we've got one more. 
in the chat that we will cover, and then I'll turn it back over to Kelsey. Um, the comment is, it appears uh, New Nuclear has a well-organized, multifaceted network of promotion. There's a similar network across many organizations, social media, nonprofits, government agencies, et cetera, exist for solar power. Um, and the question is from Kathy Wolf. So um, one, I just love the fact that you think that we're organized. Um, it doesn't necessarily feel that way on this side of the fence. So, um, you know, just, just thanks for that. I mean, um, but on a more serious note, um, I guess as, uh, as I'm engaging outside of my industry and my, I've been in nuclear power for 30 years. So clearly, clearly I like this technology. I think I would encourage all of us um, to think about being energy professionals as we proceed in an energy transition. And I think one of the places where you can get a significant amount of fact-based information on energy transition is the Department of Energy. And there are a number of different tool sets by which you can compare technologies that you can that you can um, have other national lab nerds like me, except their, their thing is solar, not solar and wind, and not necessarily nuclear power. So I would encourage you to reach out to um, the DOE or national labs. And if you don't know who to call um, relative to those spaces, um, I'd be more than happy to make those connections. But you know, you're really, we're talking about transitioning a large energy system. And, and the modeling of that and the capacity planning associated that with that, there's just not one part of our energy system that's not gonna require innovation. So it's gonna require all of us to, to divorce our technologies to a certain extent to come up with, uh, and it's gonna vary by region, right? We have wildly different resources available in each region. How we make the most of that for the next generation, I think is a real challenge. All right, thanks, Christine. Kara, Jackie, anything to add? That was really well said in my book. <laughs> Agree. All right. Oh, and I'm sorry, I've had another, so, from <laughs> Kathy, so she said that's not the question. Um, so I'm not sure what I missed there, Kathy, <laughs> the previous one. Um, Molly, I'm sure maybe Kathy, we can follow power. up with so, you. Kathy, if you're on, yeah, sure, that'd be great. Yeah, maybe Kathy, we can follow up with you offline just to see if we can find some resources to pull together and share with you. But I also wanna be respectful of our speakers time and make sure they can get to any next calls or meetings. So I can wrap us up Molly, but I greatly appreciate your moderation and leading this discussion. And thank you, Kara, Christine and Jackie for the wonderful presentations, I think. This was a much needed dialogue, and I think that the state energy offices and utility regulators on the line will get a lot of great information and action items from listening to the presentations today. And we'll make sure to share the recording and the slides with everyone who has registered. And I think as Christine just put in the chat, all the speakers would be willing to chat with you all in the future or answer any questions over email. So we'll also be sure to share their contact information. At this time, we will be transitioning over into a 20 minute states only discussion. So if anyone on the line is with the private sector or not any state government agency, we would ask that you drop off and we'll give a few minutes just for that transition to happen.